What's up, military millionaires? I'm your host, David Prey, and today I am here with my lovely co-host, Alex Felice, and a special guest, JL Collins, which I'm super stoked to bring this episode to you because, uh, well, if you've been around the community for a little while, you've probably heard me mention the simple path to wealth uh, like a hundred times. Uh, pretty much anytime somebody asks about what fund their thrift savings plan should be in or how to use their thrift savings plan, I tell them to either just leave it in the life cycle fund or to read this book and do your own due diligence. Don't just trust people on Facebook randomly talking about it. And this book, Simple Path to Wealth, uh, has just been awesome for me. And then he also recently wrote uh, how, he, how He Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. So we'll probably touch on that a little bit because I know most of our shows touch on real estate. And I think index fund investing is an incredibly passive and and productive way to invest. And so we wanted to bring that side of this. I know Alex and I both dabble in that. Uh, and really, as you said before we started recording, why I didn't reach out to you sooner, I have no idea. Welcome to the Military Millionaire Podcast, where we teach service members, veterans, and their families how to build wealth through personal finance, entrepreneurship, and real estate investing. I'm your host, David Pere, and together with my co-host, Alex Felice, we're here to be your no BS guides along the most important mission you'll ever embark on, your finances. Vehicle one, you're clear to depart friendly lines. Roger, Vic one, Oscar Mike. What's up, military millionaires? I wanted to briefly talk about a service I offer that a whole lot of people don't seem to know about, and I guess that's a failure on my part for not having discussed it enough. So look, finding a realtor that understands investing and or the VA loan or, or both is not always the easiest thing in the world. And finding a lender, same thing. So what I have started doing is I've built a, well, I have a large network, but I've started to compile it all together finally as a legitimate uh, Excel document driven, location driven, list for you guys essentially so what it what it is is basically just my way of helping connect you with a realtor or a lender that i know personally and have vetted and talked to and understand that they're not going to screw you and what i do is like for example i had a market where i had two or three agents that i all sent the same person as a connection said hey man you know i, I trust I, I know all of these let me know what you think and they all said the same agent and same thing. So what I've done is if there's multiple agents in the same market, I choose the best one and that's who I'm going to hook you up with. But the whole point of this is just to help ensure that you get connected to the best agent. So if that is something that you would like, just go to the website, go to from military to millionaire.com slash VA dash realtor slash, or just reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook, whatever. I'll send you the link or you can find it on the resources page of the website. But look, all it is is a way to help connect you with an agent who's going to hook you up. No, I don't charge a fee for you. No, I don't charge a fee for the agent. It's just a way to hook you guys up. At the end of the day, as a buyer, you're not going to pay for a realtor anyway. So, ta-da, it's magic. You might as well use one. As far as VA lender, I've got a really good one that I work with and know very well. There's several others that are pretty good. And I'll probably try to steer you away from some uh, companies that I just don't think are very reputable or have been very helpful. So, you know, if this is a service that sounds good to you for free 99, then uh, reach out. And if not, then uh, enjoy the show right now. JL, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you reached out when you did. I'm delighted to be with you. Why don't you, uh, can you give a little bit of your backstory for the audience just to, so they can get to know you? Sure. As, as you mentioned, uh, my name is J.L. Collins. Uh, I started a blog with the uh, highly creative name of jlcollinsnh.com. And there's a reason for that. I, I look at my blogging buddies who have, have uh, actually creative names for their blog, and I look at that with envy. But when I started mine in 2011, it was simply a way to archive information that I was writing down for my daughter who was then in college. And I had managed to turn her off to all things financial by pushing it too hard. And so I, I was faced with the, uh, the task of writing this stuff down so that it would be available in case I wasn't around. In fact, she likes to tease me now and then, you know, says, dad, if, if you, if I'd listened to you, there would be no blog, there would be no book, there would be no Chautauqua, which is the annual events that we take people on. So, so I guess sometimes if you have a kid who doesn't listen to you, it can turn out all right. You owe her now. <laughs> I owe her big time and, she, and she's not shy about reminding me. So how, I'm curious, how long was the blog going on before it turned into a book? What's that, what was that like? Yeah, so I started the blog in 2011, and 
The book came out in 2016, and that's a little misleading because I spent three years on the book. So I really started pulling the book together, I guess, about two years uh, into the blog. And the reason the book took so long was I, I, I don't like writing. I mean, that sounds odd. And then now that I'm an author of two books and a, and a blog that's been around for a decade, but it's, it's a big chore. And uh, I kept my editor, Tim, uh, at the time, was the, he was a much bigger believer in The Simple Path to Wealth, the book, than I was. You know, I thought, ah, who's going to care? And it's all a blog anyway. And he kept, I kept throwing it down in disgust and walking away for months at a time. And Tim would grab me by the scruff of the neck and drag me back to the computer and, and uh, figuratively. And so finally, uh, the book came out in 2016. That's a very relatable story. I <laughs> took probably a year and a half or two to get my book out. And, and I feel like I somewhat enjoy writing. I feel like it's somewhat therapeutic, but having to do it consistently, it, it becomes, yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> well, Gloria, Gloria Steinem. Uh, and is, she was a very pro prolific author. And, and uh, during an interview, uh, she was asked if she liked to write. And I think this is a great quote. Her response was, I like having written. And that's exactly how I feel about it. I love the fact that I've, I've written all these blog posts and these, these two books, and I'm about to start on a third. Um, but the price process is just, for me at least, brutal. When I hear people say they like to write, it's, it's yeah, that's, that's a tough thing to relate to. But I love having, having the end product, you know. Uh, that's weird. I really enjoy writing. I have not written a book yet, and it feels very daunting. I watched David do it, so I know I can do it. But I, uh, <laughs> but um, I love writing. I just got done writing something five thousand words, just kind of casually. I love it. So yeah, yeah, I mean, you should definitely write a book. Then it is daunting because, but you break it up in pieces, right? You do it, you do it one piece at a time. And if you're a writer, you're probably a reader. And and uh, when I started writing on a regular basis with the blog, I, stay, I started paying more attention to the structure of the books that I was reading. Because before that, when I was just reading them casually, you know, it just seemed that they were one out of a whole cloth uh, unified. But when you really start thinking about the books that you're reading, you can see how they're organized and, and how the bits and pieces were probably put together and that's how you do it. It's, you know, what's a Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So, yeah. I sort of do that now when I write, I, I get an idea and then I'm like, okay, how can I break this up into five or six ideas? Mm -hmm. And then I, and then I elaborate from there. Yeah. Um, then, then you break your book into five or six parts and then you break those parts into chapters and next thing you know, you've got a book. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you a question about debt. You have a sort of uh, opposite viewpoint about debt than a lot of, you know, our listener base. A lot of people are interested in real estate, which is very debt enthusiastic, let's say, especially with, um, you know, it's a lot of 30 year fix, which re reduces some of the risk. Right. And a lot of it is uh, historically low rates, which I don't know that it reduces risk, but it is makes it very appealing, but you don't seem that keen on it. And I sort of like that because I think people underestimate the risk of debt considerably. So I'd, I'd like to hear kind of your thoughts about it. Yeah, I think people people definitely under underestimate the risk of debt. And anybody who was around for the debacle in 07, 08, when the real estate market came crashing down along with the stock market can appreciate how debt is very much a two-edged sword, it's leverage, right? So when it works for you, it's it's a beautiful thing. And that's what attracts people to it. If you buy a $100,000 property, as an example, and you pay cash, and it goes up uh, to $110,000, well, you've made 10% on your investment. If you leverage it, which is to say, if you put, say, $10,000 down, and you borrow $90,000, well, now your $10,000 investment has gone up 100%. It's doubled. So that's the appeal. But, and that's fine. And as long as people understand that 
If it goes down 10%, you've lost 100%. And if it goes down more than 10%, you're, you're underwater, which, of course, is what happened in 07, 08. This is also what happened, by the way, in the Great Depression, because it was very easy then, and as it kind of is now, to margin stocks. Margin is just a fancy word for borrowing against your stock portfolio. And so when the stock market started plunging in, the, in 1929, the thing that exacerbated that and made and made the drop ultimately go to 90% was margin calls. People had bought all of the stock on one margin with debt. And then, of course, the brokers were calling in that debt, which forced the sale of that stock, which, of course, drove it down further and further. So, you know, leverage is a very powerful tool. And when it's working for you, that's a beautiful thing. When it's working against you, that's how people wind up bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah I mean, <laughs> I, they have strong opinions. <laughs> no, I mean, that's it, though. I mean, it just, you know, I'm just, we're, we're in this really yeah. unique kind of part of the market cycle where, and, and I feel like because we've been on this bull run for so long, I feel like we've, we've gathered along all of these younger kind of new investors that weren't around for 08 and they haven't seen a correction in now a historically long period of time. And so I don't know. I, I was barely around in 08. I certainly wasn't investing yet though. So I don't know. It just, uh, I'm curious. I always, uh, whenever we have an investor here who's been through at least one or two market cycles, I always like to ask their perspective because it's generally different um, than the people who have been doing it three to five years. You know, it is a, a Alex. It's a it's a great point because, and I think about this a lot. I started my blog in 2011. Well, there really hasn't been a, a major decline since then. It's the market's done almost nothing but march up. But you know, when COVID hit a couple of years ago, the market dropped 30 or 35 percent. But that was over in a month. I mean, that's incredibly brief. I've never, I've been investing since 1975. I've never seen a market decline and recovery that quick. And then of course, you know, we're going through a little bit of a correction now, and that seems to be recovering. Uh, you know, I think we got down about 12% or something, and now it's down 6%. And who knows where it's going to go from here, but your point's well taken. We haven't had a, a serious bear market for over a decade, and not since I started writing my blog. And I, I wonder if, you know, my readers take away the fact that the stock market is the most powerful tool for building wealth that's ever been created, and that's absolutely true. But it's also, it's also a very dangerous and volatile thing. And you have to be willing to understand that it will correct, which is a 10% drop. There'll be bear markets, which is a 20% drop, and there'll be crashes. And all of these things are perfectly normal. But for anybody who started investing in, say, 2010 or later, that's only theoretical. That's only in their mind. And whether they can really appreciate how gut-wrenching it is, uh, is another frame of reference. And uh, and uh, sort of help put that in a frame of reference, uh, in, in 07, 08, when the market had plunged, I think, 50% at this point, and it was down to about six, the S I'm talking about the S&P now, it was down to around 650, something like that. It had been cut in half. And in retrospect, that was the bottom. But what people need to appreciate is nobody knew at that point that that was the bottom. And in fact, all the smart people I knew and that I was talking to were predicting that it was going to go much, much lower. They were saying it was going to be cut by two thirds from there, which means that it, it, let's say you had a portfolio at the start of that, that was a million two, you had a million two hundred thousand dollars. Well, you know, a year, 18 months later, whatever it was, the market's been cut in half. You're sitting on six hundred thousand dollars. And all the smart money is saying in the not too distant future, that's going to be $200,000. That's what I tell people, you've got to stay the course. You can't, if you're going to follow my advice, which is to invest in the market, you can't try to dance in and out because it doesn't work. 
And you have to ask yourself, would you, are you willing to see your investment be cut in half and then have the prospect of it being cut by two thirds more? And that's the kind of intestinal fortitude it takes. Now, I had that intestinal fortitude in 07, 08. And not to say I wasn't very, very nervous and, and having doubts, but the reason I had it was in 87, when we had Black Monday and the market dropped 25% in a day, uh, I tolerated that. I knew the right thing to do was stay the course, but then the market kept grinding down lower and lower. And then finally, if, I don't know, three, four months later, whatever it was, I threw in the towel because I just didn't have the intestinal fortitude, maybe didn't have the experience. And then, of course, the moment I threw in the towel, the market started to go back up again. And when I bought it back in, it is, you know, it had exceeded where it had started before its collapse. And so that's how I had the fortitude to endure 07, 08, 09. But I don't know. I hope the people who read my stuff can have it just by reading it, that they don't have to actually get their nose bloody. Let, let me ask you one more question while we're on this topic. Um, I know that you are a big proponent of VTAX, um, Vanguard Total Index. Is that, is that still correct? Yes, VTSAX. Mm -hmm. Are you worried that the fifth largest holding of the Vanguard Total Index is Tesla? No. <laughs> no, you think so? You, I mean, as somebody who, <laughs> as somebody who, um, I'm kind of hot on this. Uh, Tesla is grossly, hilariously overpriced thing. Um, I feel like they have, I feel like they have smuggled in a risk portfolio into these total these these larger indexes that um, is not representative of what I think an ETF should be. Yeah, so that's that's actually, Alex, a great, great question, and I've never had it asked in quite that way. So the beauty of, of an index fund, and in this case, whether it's an S&P 500 fund, which owns the 500 largest uh, companies, which would include Tesla, of course, or the total stock market index fund, which owns them all, uh, and also, of course, Tesla. The beauty of that is it's self-cleansing. The beauty is that I don't have to worry about or care whether any individual company is overpriced or, or not. So if Tesla continues to outperform and, and do beautifully well, I will benefit from that. If it doesn't, in some companies, whether it's Tesla or some other companies, not all companies do, it will slowly drift down the index and eventually will drift off it. That's a process that I refer to as being self-cleansing. So the market is always self-cleansing and the market is cap weighted, which means you're always going to own the most successful companies of the moment, which is why Tesla is, you say is the fifth. I'll take your word for it. I didn't know where it ranked, but it's the fifth largest holding in, in the total stock market or the S the S and P because right now, you know, Tesla is, is killing it as, as a stock. Is that going to continue? I don't know. And, I don't have to know and I don't care. Uh, and some other stock, if it doesn't, it'll fade from you and some other stock will take its place. So you think about this and you say, well, what's the worst that can happen to any given stock? Well, the worst that can happen is that it'll go to zero. It'll drop 100%. Now, it'll fall off the index long before it gets there, but let's just say that's, that's going to happen. Maybe Tesla is going to go to zero. Okay, well, what's the best that can happen to any individual stock? Well, it can certainly go up 100%, and it can certainly double, but it can go up 200%, 300%, 600 1,000, 10,000%, as some companies do. So it's a rigged game in that sense. The worst I can lose on any given company is 100%, but the upside is almost unlimited, and that's why the stock market, while it's very volatile, as we talked about a moment ago, continues to always go up. And as long as the U.S. remains a, a capitalist economy, um, that stock market, that that process will continue and will investors will benefit. But yeah, if I were holding a collection of individual stocks and Tesla was one of them, well, I've got to be thinking about the prospects of all of those companies all of the time. 
I'm wondering, you know, is this recent pullback that Tesla's had just because the market in general is going back? Or is the world catching up with Tesla? Or is this pullback the biggest opportunity you will ever see in Tesla? And you should be dumping all your money in it. I don't know the answer to either one of those questions. I don't have to know the answer. And that's why we call it the simple path. So I'm that's gonna, why we call it the simple path. Exactly, David. Gonna, I should have, I should have had that line at the end of Vice Field. There. <laughs> well, and so I want to back it up for just a second. So for, for sure. one thing, I to, to validate everything you've said, not that it needs it. Uh, in my Facebook group, in March of 2020 and last month, I saw a massive influx of oh my gosh, I should move my thrift savings plan to the G fund. It was like clockwork. Like the market dips, people freak, and they're like, we'll put it all in bonds. You, so, have, to, you, you have to refresh my memory a little bit. The G fund's the uh, money market fund, right? Yeah. The, the, yes. The G fund is the uh, the government-backed securities bond, the right. one that never loses money and never really gains value either. Right, right. Okay. So people immediately, when the market drops, they're like, oh, let me just move everything into this thing that won't lose money. Um, And so, you know, just to validate what we were saying, but so the the reason I like your strategy and and I I think it's it's just so simple. I mean, it's literally set it, forget it, pick a fund or 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 funds, put money in it consistently. And I mean, so prior to when I first joined the military, I knew nothing about finances. And when we, when I first joined the money that you invested in the thrift savings plan started in the G fund and that was it. And I didn't know that. I didn't know any different. So my money just sat there from 2008. That's just what you on Yeah. And so now it, it goes into our life cycle fund, which is good because it's, it's not, I think you can do better on your own fund choice if you know what you're doing, but, but the life cycle fund is, is way better than bonds. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't know any better. And so I did that for what, 2008 to 2015, 2016. So, you know, through a, a great time that I would have earned a lot of money if I'd had it sitting somewhere else. Um, but now, so now I'm currently in, what is it? My allocation is like 75% C fund and 25% S fund, which pretty much mirrors the S and P 500, um, which is great. And I think so I that's checked- large cap and small cap rate right, for those funds. Correct. And I think I check my account twice a year. I mean, I, I look at the balance every month when I calculate like net worth, but I think like once or twice a year, I rebalance it and that's it. And it's great. And so I'm, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of curious if you could give like a, you know, 20 second or, or two minute overview on kind of what the, the basic, you know, if you're a young service member and you're like, wow, what is the simple path to wealth? Like what's the, what's the strategy? Yeah. So first of all, let me let me say that that while I don't remember, you know, that the TSP funds all have letters associated with them, and I my memory is not good enough to remember which letter is which portfolio. So yeah. so help me out as we go along with that. But I will say that uh, when I was writing the book and looking more deeply into the whole TPS thing, and I've never had access to it myself, but it's a wonderful way to invest. I mean, it's ultra low cost, as I recall, and and you're basically uh, investing in index funds. Uh, so uh, ex- it, expense ratio is 0.043. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So uh, by all means, if you have access to these things, you should definitely invest in them. And for instance, I tell people who uh, in the private sector, your work-related investment option are 401k programs. And those are okay, but I usually tell people when you leave that job, roll that into your personal IRA and go into a, uh, you know, a, an index fund in that because you'll have lower, you won't have all the costs associated with the program. But if you're in a TSP, I stay in your TSP. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful investment. Um, and now I have answered a question you didn't ask and I forgotten the question you did ask. <laughs> so I, my apologies. <laughs> no, no, I just, I, I guess just asking if you wanted to give a quick overview of the, the simple path to wealth strategy in general, oh, as far as right. you know, we can kind of dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, so the the simple path to wealth, the, the the basic idea is that Wall Street comes up with all of these products, and and it makes investing seem in, impossibly 
complex. Because if you try to absorb all these products, it is impossibly complex. I mean, when, when we had the crash in 07, 08, the, you know, the financial instruments that had been created to trigger that, even Wall Street didn't understand how they were operating. So that's a very intimidating kind of thing. And that drives a lot of investors to throw up their hands and say, you know what, this is beyond me and I'm going to turn it over to a professional. Well, all due respect to professionals, they don't have the best record either. Um, my attitude is if you take a little bit of time to learn some very simple basics, you can do it for less money yourself. Because the truth is you don't need all these exotic products. You need just simple, basic index funds that Jack Vogel uh, originally created back in 1975 with the idea being you're not trying to outperform the market because the truth is most funds don't outperform the market. I think the numbers are something like in any given year, maybe 25% will outperform the, uh, the basic index. When you got five years, it's down to 10 or 15%. When you got 10 years, it's five or 10%. When you got 30 years, it's less than 1%. So performance is, outperformance is very difficult to achieve. Not the least of all the reasons for that, not the least is that those funds are expensive because they employ professional managers who are supposed to outperform the market. The brilliance of Jack Bogle was he said, you know what, if you just buy the market, it's low cost, it'll have this, this process where you will always be invested in the companies that are doing well, and the companies that aren't doing well are gonna, are gonna kind of drift away. And it was beautiful in its simplicity and low cost, and it was met with enormous resistance by the financial community because it cut into their fees. Um, and for a long time, you know, it was people said, well, this can't possibly work. And, and, but over time, the research has piled up that it works phenomenally well. So the simple path to wealth simply says, when you're working and you have cash flow that is going in on a regular basis, that smooths the volatility of the stock market. And make no mistake, the stock market is very volatile. So when the market plunges and you're still putting in that, that money every month, you're buying those shares on sale. So that works in your advantage. And you're putting it in, my favorite is the total stock market index fund. I'm partial to Vanguard, uh, but other investment uh, companies offer total stock market funds as well. And a total stock market fund is basically the same no matter what, what company you buy it from. Um, the S&P 500 uh, index funds are also excellent. Uh, they're, the, as you might guess, the top 500 U.S. companies. Uh, and the truth is that because these things are cap weighted, as we talked a little bit earlier regarding Tesla, that the total stock market index fund and the S&P uh, index fund are very, very close. I think I think it's 80% uh, of the total stock market is in the S&P 500 and the other 20% are in the smaller companies. I like having that extra 20% in there. But the truth is, if you track the performance, they're almost in lockstep. So either one works uh, just fine. And if you invest in that on a regular basis and stay the course, basically you're betting on the United States of America. And if you don't think our country has a viable future going forward, and not everybody does, then this is probably not what you want to do. But if you think that it, it does have a viable future going forward and it's going to remain a capitalist country, and that's what I happen to believe, then this is the best way to participate. And then before I jump off my soapbox, if you would forgive me, um, some people say, well, what about adding international funds? And because that's what most people who write about this suggest, though, even if they're suggesting index funds, they'll say, well, you know, have a, a U.S. index fund, but also an international index fund. I don't feel the need because the top U.S. companies are international companies. And so, yes, the world in general is increasing in prosperity, 
But if you own the top U.S. companies, you are benefiting not only from the vitality of the U.S. economy, but from the vitality of the world as it continues to expand. And you get to own it in, while it's not perfect, in the stock market that is the best and most transparent and honest in the world. So now at some point, you know, maybe the U.S. share of the economy will get small enough that I'll say going to a world fund makes sense. And in fact, when I'm talking to European audiences, I'm certainly not telling them to invest everything in their own countries because those economies are just not that large. So I'm already telling them to go to a world fund. So I think that's in the future. But for right now, I'm strictly in the U.S. index funds, and that's where my daughter is, and and that would be my recommendation. I uh, I'm actually glad you said that. One of the one of the questions that I had from the Facebook group was asking, uh, with China's economy growing, would you look into Chinese index funds? But uh, clearly, we already got an answer and an explanation. So I'm going to just delete that one, but uh, thank you very much for the soapbox. Uh, That was a great overview. Um, I could not have said it better myself. And I, I have one question just to kind of drive home. uh, And I've not asked you this, but I feel like this will probably drive home to some people. Why the strategy is so awesome. How much time do you spend worrying and or managing your stock market on a daily basis? Well, so <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff because because I love it. You know, okay. I mean, this is this is my uh, uh, you know I, I take a lot of pleasure out of doing it. But I'm the odd one out, right? So I created this strategy primarily for my daughter, and my daughter could care less about this stuff. Now she knows that it's important. You know, I, I she knows that. If you get money right, if you get investing right, life is really easy, at least financially. If you don't understand money and you don't get it right, financially, life is very, very difficult. So she understands that. But I remember she said to me at one point, she said, Dad, you know, I get it. I just don't want to have to think about this stuff all the time like you do. And that's the way most people are. I'm the weirdo here. Most people have better things to do with their time than to think about investing in in money. Uh, And that's who I wrote The Simple Path to Wealth for. The biggest compliment I get from people who read my blog or the book is when they say, you know, I've never really understood this financial stuff. I'm not really interested in it, but I read your book and suddenly it made sense. Suddenly it was accessible to me. Because that's the kind of people I'm writing to. By the same token, you know, not surprisingly, my writing attracts a lot of people who, like me, are really into this stuff. And, of course, they're like, well, yeah, but what if we, you know, what if you just tinkered with this? What if you added a little bit of leverage? What if you, you know, what if you did more small cap? Uh, uh, Maybe you should, you know, overweight and small cap uh, index because small caps tend to outperform over time. And it's... You know, they always want to tinker. And, uh, you know, you're never going to convince somebody that who's really into this stuff not to tinker, so I don't try. But I think you will get a less good result by tinkering. And my daughter's superpower, and by extension, anybody who, who really doesn't care about this stuff but chooses to embrace the simple path, the superpower is that once she sets this up and starts putting money in on a regular basis – the fact that she's not going to be inclined to pay attention is she's not going to notice when the market drops. So she's not going to be inclined to panic and sell. Uh, and as Warren Buffett famously said, uh, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but at the start of the last century, uh, the 1900s, the market was 600 and or 60 and it ended at 14,500 and, Rhetorically, Buffett said, how do you lose money in a market that does that? And he answers his own question saying, you lose money by trying to dance in and out of it, by trying to time it. Well, my daughter will never be tempted to dance in and out of it because she doesn't care. I mean, that's a temptation I have to fight all the time. But and that's the you know, my my readers who are into this stuff and want to tinker. That's 
the temptation that they succumb to. And I'd be willing to bet that if you took all those people who read my stuff that are inclined, that are really interested in this and really inclined to, to tinker, and then you took all the people who read my stuff, like my daughter, who just want to understand the few basic things they need to know and then set it and let it run, there's no question that's the group that's going to outperform in 20, 30, 40 years, in my mind. Yeah, uh, Buffett pretty much, I think he proved it. You know, he said, let's take a 20 year uh, ETF versus, you know, the, the market managers of the world. And I think the ETF beats them at no cost. And the, the market managers are really the only one kind of winning, <laughs> not, the, not the funds themselves. And I find it so fascinating, the, the market um, that, you know, the simple, like, set it and forget it. Don't think about it. Don't like, it makes more money. And it really does. And maybe not over the last few years, but in a larger, you know, if you're tinkering and you're buying crypto or you're buying some of these high risk assets, when the market's up, you can have these big returns. But then when the market crashes, that's where everybody rushes out of the high volatility. And then over time, it all washes out. And, you know, the market average is the market average. And it's incredibly difficult to beat that market average. And then on top of that, it takes an immense amount of labor. And so uh, it's a, it's a, it's an emotional kind of a, it's, it's difficult to fight those emotions where you're like, well, I want to make more and I want to invest my labor in this and I can get good at this. And the reality is almost like the overwhelming majority of people can't get better than this. They can't beat it. And then it sucks the life out of them and the time out of them trying. And it's like, you know, if you just did what JL is saying, you'd actually be less stressed out and you'd make more. It's a really, it's a really mental, uh, I don't know if you guys have this thing I have, it's called ego, egomania, right? Of course. <laughs> and I got to get that thing out of the way. It's like literally getting in my own way and taking up my time and stress. Yeah, I, I, I could not agree more, Alex, with, with what you just said. It's, and it's so tempting. This is the reason that, I mean, it took me a long time to embrace indexing. Uh, Jack Bow came out with the first index fund in 75, which happens to be the first year I started investing. I didn't learn about index funds for a decade, so say 85. And then when I learned about them, it just seemed so counterintuitive to me. And again, I was somebody who liked doing this stuff, right? And I, you know, I, I would say to myself, well, you know, if I can just avoid the bad companies, I'm going to outperform the index. <laughs> Or, or if I just focus on the handful of really good companies, I can outperform. Well, the problem is that the really good companies today are tomorrow's Enrons. If anybody, you know, Google Enron, if, you, if that doesn't resonate with you. And hey, tomorrow's laggards are, you know, are, or today's laggards might be tomorrow's exciting turnaround story. You don't know. And it takes, an, as you point out so well, it takes an enormous amount of effort. And the, the, the compliment I get that I like least, <laughs> I like all the compliments I get, but the compliment I get that I like least, because I think it's so off target, is when people are talking about my work, usually not to me, but they'll say, you know, the simple path to wealth is great for people who don't want to put in any, in any, in any effort. You know, and and that's most people. So most people should read this book and follow JL's advice. I'm like, no, no. The simple path to wealth is the most powerful way. If I thought there was a, I'm greedy enough that if I thought there was a more powerful way to invest than with the simple strategy I lay out that would give me a better return over time, that's what I would have written about. So investing in index funds, the simple path is not only has the virtue of simplicity, which you described so well, but it has the virtue of being the most powerful way you can invest. Well, it's got such a low barrier to entry too. Uh, Vanguard, is it, is it still 2000 is the minimum to get into VTSAX? You know, I haven't I looked wrong. in a long time. Last time I looked at, I think it was three. Okay. But that oh, yeah. have, you might be more in tune with that than I am. Well, well, let's say it's 3000. I mean, yeah. and then from there on, you could put $5. A month. I mean, it's it, the barrier to entry to get into index funds or, or Vanguard specifically is it, it's so low. Well, and you can, and you can buy, you know, David uh, VTI, which is the exchange traded fund ETF version of the portfolio for the cost of a single share, which I don't know, is a couple hundred bucks. So you can actually access the portfolio for 
a lot less with the uh, ETF version, which is VTI. Oh, so it's even better than you're describing. But even with three thousand dollars, I you know, I mean that's pretty low barrier to entry. Yeah, yeah. And then you just got to be consistent. And, uh, yeah, and and not pay attention to the market. Don't try to, you know. And the worst thing you can do is invest when everything's going well, and and then say, oh, I'm not going to invest this month because the market's down. No, that's exactly when you want to invest. In fact, I tell young people. That the I had this conversation with a young friend of mine just the other day that the single best thing that could happen to you is for the market to take a major crash and stay down for the next decade while you're adding money, you're buying shares on sale. Won't be wouldn't be so great for me at my age, but that'd be that'd be great for anybody in their their twenties. So, yeah, you shouldn't be, when you take the simple path, you don't have to be afraid of market drops. You know, you're just going to look at them and say, oh, okay, the market's doing what the market does. This is a natural part of the process. And oh, by the way, that money I'm putting in every month, I'm getting more shares for it than I did before. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. This is perfect. My, my girlfriend doesn't invest. She doesn't know anything about it. She knows she has to do it. She doesn't want to spend a lot of time learning on it. She has no emotional attachment really to money at all right she just no she doesn't want to run out and so right. i'm like this is what you do you stick a you stick a, the same amount of money every week in the same fund and then you never look at it and then in 20 years when you look at it you'll figure out you're fine <laughs> she, she sounds she sounds uh, alex a lot like my daughter and the same same attitude and i would say to your girlfriend the same thing i i say to my daughter that that disinterest is your superpower I mean, if you just take the time to get a couple of basics right and put this in motion and set up, you know, automatic investments and, and then you can forget about it. Jack Bogle used to say, you know, and this is in the days when uh, uh, when everything wasn't on computers and you actually got paper statements in the mail of your accounts. He used to say, don't even open your statements, you know, just let them accumulate for the next 20 years. And then 20 years from now, open one. And you'll be dumbstruck at what it's grown to. Yeah, but and, you know, if you pay attention to all the little ups and downs of the market, you'll drive yourself crazy. And you'll probably drive yourself to make some stupid mistakes. I At least I, I know I did. <laughs> so I kind of want to ask a little bit of an off-the-wall question with this. I think in 2001, the tech bubble... I, I don't know if this is actually true, but the narrative that I've convinced myself of is that a lot of it was caused by the, um, you could trade on the internet for the first time, cheap, the, the cheap $7 Scott trade, E-Trade, that was all new. And I wonder if now, and so you had all this new liquidity that you didn't have, right? And so I wonder if now we're seeing something similar with, um, you can go on Robinhood on your cell phone and you can trade for free or, you know, Right. In, in practice free. And so I, I wonder if that messes with the liquidity and the volatility because people can rush in and they can rush out faster than ever before. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that I have the answer for it. The other, the other element that you could have thrown in there is I want to say about a decade, a decade ago when they had, uh, when programmed trading became very popular and there were, there were a couple of times where the market would just take incredibly wild swings because the computer programs were reacting to things they'd been programmed to react to. And, and you know, there are things called flash crashes, which I haven't heard about for a while. So maybe they've ironed that out of the system. All of that in my world is noise. I mean, there is a lot of volatility in the market. That certainly, um, uh, you know, with Robinhood and the ease of investing, and it becomes almost a, a video game, I think, for some investors. Uh, you know, that's, that's noise. And we're in it, for, if, if you're following my path, we're in it for the long term. In my book, and also in the blog, I, I describe it as a glass of beer, right? So let's suppose that, that you order a beer in, in your local tavern, and, and the bartender brings it to you in, in, a, in a mug and it's, you know, it's not transparent. So you're looking at this nice foamy head of the beer and you have no idea how much of the beer is foam and how much is the actual beer because it depends on how he drew it, right? 
So if he drew it down the side of the of the mug, you know, you've got a relatively little foam and a lot of beer. But at any given point in time in the stock market, that foam is the volatility and the active trading that you're describing, right? It's people, you know, on Robin Hood and buying and selling quickly and and uh, you know, back in the at the tech crash, the same kind of thing. Underneath that is the actual beer. And the actual beer in our analogy here are the actual companies you're buying. Because when you buy the index fund, you are in a very, very real sense, you are buying a piece of every publicly traded company in the United States. You own a piece, very small piece, but you own a piece of every one of those businesses. And those businesses are very tangible things. And that's the beer. And the foam in that glass is all that trading that's going on. And you can never be quite sure at any given moment how much of the price of your portfolio is foam and how much of it is beer. But you do know that there is a core of beer. And over time, the foam will dissipate and the beer will be left. And that's what you're really investing in. Now, if you're trading, then you're focused on the foam. But I'm not an advocate of trading. I I like beer, so that's a great analogy for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, it appeals to a lot of people. I found. <laughs> I, know, I, came I, love- up, I came up with an analogy years ago when I was writing the blog post about this, and I I said, "Oh yeah, this this kind of I must have been drinking a beer at the time." And I, ah, oh, this this kind of a good way to illustrate it, and it's become uh, one of the more famous and and uh, I guess well liked. Uh, analogies in the blog. So <laughs> little did I know. I love this. Um, just this whole, you know, ideology about investing, because this is how I started investing because I was, you know, 30 and broke and had been broke for a long time and didn't know anything about money. And, and I was scared of the market. And I'm a fairly risk averse guy in general. And I was like, I got to get something that works and I got to get something that will for sure work. I got to get a process that will work. And so I was like, Oh, ETFs. Right. And it seems simple now, but when you're new, you're like, okay, what is that? And like you said, you got to learn a few things and then you're like, okay, right. this works. And you just, you start buying. Now I learned real estate and, you know, I was glad I did because I bought real estate at the bottom of the, basically the bottom of the crash. And I bought a bunch and now I'm, you know, I, it makes me look like I really knew what I was doing. Um, <laughs> but it was the same idea, right? It's all buy and hold right. investing. It wasn't a business. It was like, look, if you can buy this thing at half of what it's worth, like real estate, real estate's kind of like the market. It's going to go up in the long run, despite, volatility in the short run, but I'm always playing for the long run. And I just, I say all that to say, like, I really love hearing this perspective because I feel like nowadays, again, I think it's because we've had 12 years of market mania. Everybody's overconfident and they're like, here's how you make all these outsized gains. And I don't get to hear very many people say, don't worry about outsized gains, like just bet um, steady, reliably, and take your emotion out of it. Take your take all the labor out of it and just do the reliably smart thing and it'll work out. And I miss this kind of, uh, this kind of mentality because it's very, it's very refreshing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and I am, I am certainly guilty as guilty as anybody of this, but the idea of, of easy and large investment returns is enormously seductive. And as I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, you know, it took me a decade or, or maybe more to embrace indexing because you know, I, I, I'd been somewhat successful picking individual stocks and actively managed funds. That's actually how I achieved financial independence. Um, but it's just a lot more work. And it's not as powerful as indexing is over time. But you read the stories of, you know, people who bought Bitcoin when it was 30 cents or a dollar, and, and now it's trading at $40,000 or or this GameStop that was popular about a year ago. I don't know where that's gone, but you know, you read all the stories of instant wealth and I, I, that's very intoxicating. Um, but it's also very elusive and it, and it disappears pretty quickly. Um, I, yeah, there was, I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. There was an article I was reading about these two guys who, who made millions in Bitcoin and they're, trying to replicate that and that's slowly frittering it away. So, um, you know, this, the simple path to wealth is not a get rich quick scheme. It's, it's a, it's something that will make you wealthy over time, but it will work for everybody. Whereas, you know, 
being lucky enough to get into Bitcoin at the right time, which is probably not now, uh, or lucky enough to get into GameStop just before uh, the Robin Hood people drive it to nonsensical levels, you know, that's, that takes, that takes a lot of luck. And I, I, I would love to have been on the ground floor of any of those myself, but I spent enough years looking for those kinds of things to know just how hard it is. Well, so to, I love, this is one of the reasons I love the thrift savings plan, especially for like young service members, because the way it's set up is you go into your, my pay, like your, your salary, direct deposit, the same spot you choose, what bank your money goes to. And you just click on a percentage. And then once you go in and you, you change, even if you don't, if you don't change it now, it goes to life cycle. But once you change your fund allocation, if you don't want life cycle, literally just contribute out of your paycheck. You never see it. It's totally passive. It's completely hands off. They, they match 5%. It's great. Uh, but you did mention something and I had two questions left from the Facebook group and, and you, you mentioned one of them. So we're going to, we're going to ask that one real quick and that I know we want to be respectful of your time, but, uh, so the question, obviously I had like four or five people asking about your thoughts on crypto. And I know that's a really broad question. So I'm going to narrow it down more to, do you think that, or, or maybe you personally, but, but what are your thoughts on like the crypto index funds? Do you think there's a spot in a portfolio for that? Or is the jury still out because of how new it is? So I, I, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not knowledgeable about the crypto index funds. If I were inclined to invest in crypto, it would probably be with the index funds. Um, Lucas, who is the guy who does the tech support on my blog, is an investor in crypto. And back in 2017, at my request, he wrote a guest post for me about the subject because I don't really know very much about crypto. And he's, he's a big fan. And of course, if anybody had invested in crypto in 2017, they would have done very well. Uh, I didn't. And then a year ago, uh, and I want to say maybe May or June of last year, uh, I asked Lucas to revisit the subject. So he wrote another guest post. And I also wrote a post immediately before his on my thoughts on crypto, which in a nutshell is crypto, in my view, is, is not it's not an investment and it's not at this point really a currency either because it's too volatile to serve as a currency in most situations. And of course it was created to be a currency. So it's, it's a very volatile, it's a speculation. It's something that you buy hoping and assuming that somebody else will be willing to pay more money for it in the future. So in that sense, it's like gold or silver. Uh, although gold and silver have some tangible value that, underline them that, that maybe crypto doesn't. Now, clearly, if I had dumped everything I owned in 2017 and, and put it in, in Bitcoin, and I can't think of what the other one was that Lucas was mentioning when he wrote that blog post, I would be ahead of where I am now. But that's a speculation. Sometimes speculations turn out spectacularly well. Sometimes they don't. I mean, it's kind of like saying if I'd gone to the horse track and and put all my net worth on, on one of the horses and it happened to win at 40 to one, I'd be a lot better off, but they don't always win. In that case, it did. So to me, crypto is not a currency yet. Maybe it will be someday. And it's not really an investment. It's a speculation. And I'm not a speculator. I'm an investor. I want to invest in productive assets, which are businesses that actually create products or services that they sell and that can grow on that. And of course, real estate also falls into that category. So that's the kind of, those are investments as opposed to gold, which is a speculation um, in crypto. I like that answer. Uh, I, I don't know that I've publicly put too much information out there about my crypto gambling, which is literally what it is. I took like a couple hundred bucks, gambled one, and then started like, buy like 20 different uh, coins at like a hundred dollars and whichever one skyrocketed, I sold all my principal out and whatever. Uh, but I mean, it's like 1% and I acknowledge that it is gambling <laughs> and it's, you know, 1% of my portfolio and it's fun, but it's, you know, it is what it is. So it, it I agree on the speculation. Uh, the one other question I had on here, which I think is interesting. Uh, 
how are you factoring or are you uh, inflation when calculating uh, like your amount needed for retirement, like the 4% rule and stuff like that? So I guess that's really just more of a, does inflation bother you or worry you with this strategy at all? Uh, it seems to be kind of a you know current theme of events. Yeah, so that's that's kind of a two part question: inflation, and then you know, as, as it pertains maybe to the four percent rule. So, starting with inflation, um, you know, we were talking earlier about how a lot of young investors have never experienced a bear market, and you got to be pretty old to have experienced an inflationary economy in this country. I am pretty old, so I remember the stagflation uh, years, which ran from the early 70s into the early 80s. And um, it, it's an ugly time. Um, and I, I am a little bit concerned that maybe we are entering into another period of inflation. And stagflation, by the way, simply meant a stagnant economy and inflation on top of it, which is kind of the worst of all worlds. Uh, and the stock market suffered for that decade. It, it kind of bounced up and down. Now, if you'd followed the simple path and you were investing continually in it, you would have been okay. And then when the stock market suddenly turned on a dime in around 82, then you would have done uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, you know, there was a, I think it was in 1979, which was sort of late into the stagflation time, uh, I want to say it was Time Magazine ran a cover story called The Death of Equities. Well, they were basically predicting that, uh, you know, the stocks were going to cease to exist or something. And boy, if that wasn't a signal for a market bottom, I don't know what is. Because as Warren Buffett, I think, has famously said, you know, the time to be buying is when there's blood in the streets um, and everybody's pessimistic. So I am very concerned about inflation. Uh, I think the simple path will will be the best way to navigate through it. Uh, if we were to go into hyperinflation, which is just inflation on steroids, the kind that you see in Venezuela at the moment, the kind that you see in Russia at the moment with their invasion of Ukraine, I, I don't think there's any defense against against that. I think you're just you're you're done. Uh, and I don't see our country, I think our country is far more economically sound. I don't see that as a threat in the United States. But uh, the kind of inflation that we could very well have, reminiscent of the 70s, I think the simple path to wealth, you'll do fine, remembering this is a long-term strategy. Now, will the 4% rule hold up? Um, a couple of things to think about and remember, and you might want to go to my blog, I've written about the 4% rule in some depth, and it's also in my book, and I reproduce the charts from the Trinity study, which looked at it in depth. And the Trinity study looked at, at all kinds of, of portfolio uh, percentages, everything from 100% stocks to 100% bonds. So 100, you know, 80, 20, 70, 30, 50, 50, you know, on down. And then they looked at different percentage withdrawal rates, everything from, I think, 2% to maybe 10%. And then they looked over a period of 30 actual years, 30 year periods. And they basically tabulated all this data and said, what would happen in those scenarios? And if you uh, were withdrawing, if you had, I think they used a 50-50 stock and bond portfolio and you were withdrawing 4% a year and you adjusted it every year for inflation, that at the end of 30 years, 96% uh, of the time, you would still have money left over. What goes unsaid in that is that, you know, the 4% of the time you would have run out of money and that's the scary thing. But of the 96% of time when you would have had money left over, you would have had a spectacular amount of money left over. The point being, I mean, it would have grown, your portfolio pulling only 4% would have grown enormously. Uh, the point being that the 4% withdrawal rate is really a very conservative withdrawal rate. And there's a lot of discussion over whether it's too high or whatever. I think it's pretty conservative. Uh, the guy who originally came up with the idea is on record of actually recommending like six, seven percent. Uh, I think that is a little high. That would make me uncomfortable. 
But the most important factor to consider is it's not, don't think of it as a rule, think of it as a guideline. I think 4%, even if we go into a period of stagflation, is a brilliant guideline. And what's the difference between a rule and a guideline? Well, a rule says you can withdraw your 4% percent adjust for inflation every year and damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. I'm not going to pay any attention anymore. Well, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that for two reasons. One is you might run out of money and you certainly don't want that. But equally important, your portfolio might be, well, you're pulling 4% might be growing to these extraordinary levels where you could be enjoying much more of that money. So it's a great guideline. I might say, you know, start with 4% and pay attention. Uh, in, in like 2010, uh, my own withdrawal rate was around 5%. Uh, so I was a little bit over that. And, you know, I had some extra expenses going on, but I was comfortable with 5% because 5% works most of the time. And the market was rising. Now, you can be sure I was paying pretty close attention to the market. Had that turned, had it gone against me, then I would have adjusted my my spending. And I wouldn't have been pulling automatically 5%. So that's how I look at that. And that's a phenomenal answer, and I appreciate it. And I think that so that's, that's all – well, I wish I could take credit for it, but that was from the, the Facebook group. Uh, and that actually wraps up our Facebook group questions. And I, I don't, I don't know that there's anything, is there anything we missed? I guess that would be my final question is if there's anything we missed or parting shots, you'd like to get out yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, of course. What's up Alex. with the new book? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't even, do, I was, the goal of getting him on the show was to talk something other than real estate, Alex. And you're trying to drag us back into real estate. <laughs> you know what? I'm here to help. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, went, I was about to say, man, I can't think of anything else. You guys have great questions. You wrote a book. It seems you're, you're welcome to be covered up around. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I do have uh, I do have a new book. Actually, it's not that new. It's been out for about six months now. And it's called How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. Very different than The Simple Path to Wealth. Much shorter. It's, it's the sad, tragic, hopefully uh, informative tale of, of the first piece of real estate I ever bought. And if somebody came up with a list of all the mistakes you could make buying real estate, it's like I went down that list and checked them all off and, and made sure I did I did everything wrong. So the subtitle is a cautionary tale. It's very short. It's illustrated. Uh, I found a wonderful illustrator. So it's it's kind of a fun, amusing story with with, uh, I think, a hopefully a sobering message for anybody who's investing in real estate. I'm, I used to invest in real estate for me, and it's a great way to make money. I'm, um, if you go in wide open and you've done your homework, uh, there's no question you make money investing in real estate. I didn't do that initially. I did so later. But for me, it just became too much like work, and it was not the kind of work I, I personally enjoyed. But, uh, but yeah, for anybody who's thinking about investing in real estate, I'm going to selfishly say, read my book first, and then you will know what not to do. And that's frequently even more important than knowing what to do. I got to check this out because I was under the impression that real estate only goes up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Well, you you must have been born in 2010. (laughs) Wait, I thought the simple path was day trading. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you must have just not been paying attention at all. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah. sir, thank you so much for joining us today. This is I, so this is different from the normal topics that we cover and something that I love. And personally, I, I would say not enough of my portfolio is in, in index funds, but probably like 15%. Yeah. Um, and the remaining 82, 83% is probably real estate and cash. But, uh, you know, I, I'm working more and more towards it. I've got index funds set up for both of my kids. Uh, all my, st- all the stimuluses from last year went into, went into accounts for the kids and, uh, you know, trying to set that up and I, I love it. So I so really on, appreciate having on you on my, the show. I just lost, I just lost you. Yeah. He Uh-oh. stopped paying his internet bill. They just turned it off right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's well, really weird. I can hear you guys fine. 
Yeah, no, you were, right. I lost the last few things you, you said, but I, one of the things that, that you know, I've got a lot of friends who invest in real estate and one of the strategies that, and of course they know, you know, what, what my approach is. And one of the strategies, a uh, few of them have engaged in as they've gotten older and, and they don't want to put in the effort that real estate takes is they're starting to channel some of their, their, uh, uh, their profits from real estate into index funds and sort of make that transition so that when they're older and and want to take, uh, you know, have a little easier life, then, then they can slowly transition out of it. So they will have benefited from, because real estate's really two things. It's an investment, but it's also a job, right? And so when they want to transition away from the, the work that real estate takes, uh, you know, they can do it slowly over time and move into next funds. I think that's a pretty good strategy if if you're a real estate investor and and but see a time when you don't want to put in that kind of effort. Yeah, I, I love it. I love the overall passive approach. Um, I think it's undervalued right now. I think, you know, the mania and all of the wins are convincing people you know, everybody's a genius in the market, that kind of thing. And, and I think um, there's a whole generation of investors who are, you know, huh, the joke I say is there's people who are up 15% in a market that's up 20 and they're feeling real good about themselves. And I think there's been a whole generation of people who, um, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it is an inflationary environment. And, you know, I, I know that I, I'm fairly convinced that it won't be as, um, the market won't stay as lucrative as it has been for this bull run forever. There'll be a correction of some sort. And when people lick their wounds, they're going to say, okay, I don't want that stress ever again. And things like, you know, this simple path to wealth, a very, you know, Buffett style, simple, but almost basically guaranteed to work um, will, will rise back. I, I, I don't know. If, I don't want to say it will rise back in popularity. I just mean like in my social circle, you know, everybody's chasing these big wins and seemingly easy, easy money. And nobody's, there's not a lot of um, multi-cycle wisdom uh, in my peer group right now. And so I think that will come to fruition much more and much more popularity as we see more, as we see the next cycle. You know, that's, that's a, that's a great point, Alex. And, and it leads me to, to one other point that I'd like to make is, is, you know, you guys, I forget which one of you, but observed that, uh, uh, you know, we haven't had a, a, a crash or even a major correction for a long time. But those are perfect. That is, that is coming. I have no idea when it's coming. I'm not predicting it for any given period of time. But those are a perfectly natural part of the process. So I don't believe for a moment, and I don't think anybody should be silly enough to believe that we are never going to see that again. We're absolutely going to see, well, we've already seen what's called a correction, which is a 10% drop and technically 20% is what they call a bear market and you get a 30 plus percent drop and you're into crash territory. All of those things are perfectly normal. All of those things will continue to happen in the future. None of them are predictable. So you just have to stay the course, stay invested, keep investing to take advantage of those drops and not worry about it, not paying on the rest of the world to be panicking. You know, that when the market does finally plunge 30 or 40 percent and some someday it will uh you know the media will be going berserk and people will be headed for the exits including those people who maybe enjoyed easy money gains um but people on the simple path will shrug their shoulders turn over and go back to sleep and knowing their investment investments are automated they'll be taking care of it and that the market will always recover because it always does and the day that it doesn't, then none of this will matter. It won't matter where your money is because that'll be that'll be the end of uh, our society. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, sir, where what is the best place for people to get a hold of you if they'd like to reach out? Yeah, probably the best place to start is the blog, and that's J L Collins C O L L I N S N H uh, at uh, dot com. And then uh, from jlcollinsnh.com, you know, you'll have access to my Twitter and Facebook. And, and uh, yeah, I hope people do reach out. Absolutely. Thank you very much for joining us today. This has Thanks. been a phenomenal episode. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've had a blast. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been fun hanging out with you guys.
Absolutely. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to millionaire.com slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show. Give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take action.